Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome uh, to this special uh, pre-election uh, panel event. My name is Maxine McHugh. I'm the primary fellow here at the Graduate School. I'd first of all like to start by acknowledging the elders, families, and descendants of the Wurundjeri people uh, who have been custodians of these lands for many generations. I acknowledge that the land in which we meet was the place of age-old ceremonies of celebration, initiation, and renewal and that the local Aboriginal peoples have had and continue to have a unique role of life in this university. It's my pleasure now to, uh, to introduce our panel and then our topic. Um, first of all, I just want to explain that my colleague, Catherine Henderson over here, um, she will explain why she's standing. She's standing because she's a teacher, and teachers always stand. <laughs> uh, Catherine, of course, is director of the University of Melbourne uh, Network of Schools. Uh, we also, of course, have our, our host today, Professor Phil Rickards, the Dean of NGOC, then Professor Jeff Masters, CEO of the Australian Council of Educational Research, Professor Barry McGaw, Director of the Assessment Research Centre here at the Graduate School, Professor Colette Taylor, our Chair of Early Childhood Education and Care, and of course, uh, Dr. Glenn Savage, who's going to be learning a lot more about early childhood as a new dad, um, Senior Lecturer in Education Policy. Glenn sent around um, an email the last 24 hours saying, I'm ready to go, my wife let me sleep in the spare room and then I'm asleep. Well, that puts ahead of, him ahead of a lot of the rest of us. Now, um, you may have noticed, folks, um, this is a provocative title. Some of you might say, would we ever see something like public spending in health, investment or waste? Well, look, it's deliberately provocative. Um, this is being held, this event, this discussion on the eve of an election, but we would suggest this is a relevant uh, topic for any time, certainly for the near future. Um, it's not just my contention, but uh, the view of many others, there simply won't be extra buckets of money uh, coming from governments in the years ahead. So this critical question of how we invest the dollars that we do have, how we invest, what are the targets, targeted strategies, is, is um, intensely relevant. Uh, we're going to hear from each of our speakers, about two or three minutes each, after which we'll dive into questions. We've had a lot of interest from uh, regional schools, most of which can't be here today, um, but that's why we're filming this event uh, and accepting their questions online. If you have a smartphone, please submit your questions via the online platform Today's Meet. The URL is on the screen. And uh, if those without a smartphone, our staff members Holly and Tracy, Holly and Tracy, are here and you can just uh, send questions down the line to them. I'm now going to ask um, Professor Phil Rickards to begin with his opening statement. Thank you, Phil. Well, thank you, Maxine. As you said, this is a provocative title, and while it's always important uh, that how we spend public money, I think now is the time where it's probably never been more important. So the total edu education spending has been rising steadily over at least the last decade. But concomitant with that is the same decline in Australia's performance, and uh, this suggests that we're not investing in things the right way. So you wouldn't be surprised when I say what matters most in student learning is the effectiveness of the teacher. So while public spending is under pressure, I think we have to focus on the greatest needs and invest in teachers and evidence-based interventions that work. Cambria College, which features in the ABC's Revolution School documentary, and we took part in that, is a great example of targeted investment. The final episode airs tomorrow night, and it clearly shows that Cambria, under the exceptional leadership of Michael Muscat, who is here today, dramatically transformed itself, and with the appropriate support of some dollars at an early stage. They didn't go through the usual popular answers of more discipline and smaller class sizes, rather they took what we call a clinical approach to teaching, setting clear goals for each student and evaluating the impact on each student's learning. They worked in collaborative teams, both within the school and with other schools, to look at the evidence of what was having impact in the classroom. So I think the Australian governments need to work with school leaders and teacher education providers to 
One, recognise excellent teachers through new professional structures and pay levels. These excellent teachers should become leaders of collaborative teams. They need to share expertise. We need to ch change the factory model culture away from teaching working in isolation in 30, with 30 students to teachers working together in collaborative teams. I believe that teaching is far too complex and challenging just for one person. We need to deliver uh, to develop school networks so they can share success with each other. But lastly, we need to increase the effectiveness of all teachers, providing appropriate professional development to help them interpret data and accurately identify and address the needs of individual learners. I think Australia needs a long-term strategy to respond, I think, to a, a serious long-term decline. It's not, reversing Australia's decline is not a short-term fix. I think it's a 15 to 20 year bipartisan approach that's required. And I think that change will only occur in, a, in Australia when it's driven by teachers who are supported so they can become highly developed experts in what ho I hope will become a widely respected profession. Thank you, Maxine. Thank you. And Chris, uh, if I can ask you to uh, finish your presentation, thanks. Um, thanks, Maxine. Um, as an opening comment, um, I believe that as a nation, um, we need to recognise that planning and preparing the workforce for a changing Australian economy will almost certainly require new levels of investment in education and training. I say this because it's obvious many traditional occupations are disappearing. As we um, reimagine and reposition Australia's economy, we'll require a much larger number of knowledge workers, people who can work in teams, capitalise on advances in technology, solve new kinds of problems, create innovative solutions. We'll also need people with high levels of knowledge and skill in science, technology, engineering and mathematics. This is not a, not a self-serving argument on the part of educators. Um, it's an observation made from economics. There's a significant return to the economy in investing in education to ensure that our workforce has the knowledge and skills to compete and contribute internationally um, into the future. Nevertheless, the, the challenge we're here to discuss tonight um, is to identify proven um, cost-effective strategies to improve educational outcomes. One cost-effective strategy, and, and one um, that I believe we could do a much better job of implementing, is to learn from the best of current practice. It's clear, and some people have made attempts to quantify this, um, and I won't do that here, um, but it's clear that massive improvements would be made in the quality and equity of Australian schooling if all teachers taught as effectively as our most effective teachers. If all school leaders were as effective as our most effective school leaders. Um, if we could get our most effective teachers teaching in the schools where highly effective teaching is most needed. Um, if we could get all schools um, as effective uh, as our most effective schools, and, and by most effective I mean either um, in terms of making outstanding improvements in performance um, or punching above their weight given their um, student intakes and the context in which they operate. Um, so to me this means we need to do a better job as, as a profession um, of learning how to improve um, by systematically identifying highly effective teachers, highly effective leaders, um, highly effective schools, um, by studying those teachers, leaders and schools to better understand what they do, and then by finding ways to promote best practice in all schools and all classrooms, um, by capturing and promulgating <coughs> what I've just been describing, um, what we're learning about best practice, um, by getting high-performing schools, working with low-performing schools, high-performing teachers, mentoring low-performing teachers, high-performing school leaders working with lower-performing school leaders. These, I think, are, are cost-effective strategies. What I'm proposing here is, is not simply networking. Um, it's What I'm dis describing um, is more systematic, it's more research-based, um, it's more deliberate um, than that. It depends on learning what it takes to improve, um, then finding ways to promote that learning across the profession. Thank you. And uh, Baron Ford. Well, thank you, Maxine. Um, when I was at the OECD as Director for Education, we produced the first PISA results and one of the things we showed was the relationship between countries' achievements and their level of expenditure. What it showed was 
in general, the more you spend, the more you get. There are lots of exceptions, but in general, the more you spend is what you get. The more you spend, the more you get. Now, what people have picked on at a time when there's um, an apparent risk of redistribution of existing resources, since there are no more resources, is the evidence of the cases where expenditure apparently is making no difference. So the moment redistribution emerges, those that have say, what we have makes no difference, so leave us where we are. That's the way the discussion about funding is presently mostly being constructed. But I'm going to give you a very specific proposal about how we can save money and do better. In Finland, the selection ratio into teacher education is about 3,000 applicants, two to 3,000 applicants for 120 to 130 places. Very strenuous selection into teacher education, which is, as a result has made it more attractive, more competitive entry than into medicine. And that confers status on the profession. Now, how might, might we do that? Well, here's how we should do it. The problem in Australia is there are too many teachers. Because there are so many teachers, we can't seriously raise their salaries. It's a very big labour force. What we need to do is to have fewer teachers and pay them more. And the way to have fewer teachers is to restructure the teaching profession so there are many more parallel professionals um, supporting the work of teachers. So the teachers do only those things for which their professional training is needed and support staff do the things for which you don't need to be a teacher to do. Now, the first country that really went seriously down that track was England. Uh, with a very large number of paraprofessionals introduced into schools during the initial Blair government. And they had a five-year study of how it worked, and that was reported in a Dean's lecture here by Peter Blacksford from the Institute of Education in London in April this year. And he showed that the five-year study showed, by and large, it hadn't worked. And that the reason it hadn't worked was the teachers were not trained in, at all in how to use the paraprofessionals now in schools. And the paraprofessionals, by and large, were given the most difficult students, the most needy students, to work with one on one. So you had the least qualified people, who didn't know the substance, and didn't have the pedagogical skills, dealing with the students whose need was greatest. What they've done, however, based on the cases that they found that were working, is now produced training materials for teachers on how to interact with paraprofessionals, and on paraprofessionals, how to interact with students. Not presuming they're becoming the pedagogues but what kinds of things they should do. So that's my suggestion. Restructure the teaching profession in much the way we've restructured the nursing profession in this country. The professional nurses have now moved up into the lower end of the domains of what doctors used to do. Enrolled nurses have come in between, nursing aides working on other things. The work is differentiated. We should do that in teaching. I've got about four million questions. <laughs> that, but I'm going to, I'm going to start. <coughs> Thanks, Barry. Uh, Colin Taylor. Thank you. Thanks, Maxine. I'm going to take you upstream now of the school education system to early childhood. Um, Australia's early childhood provision has really grown rapidly over the past decade to meet the demand for more programs. We've tripled our investment to $7.7 .7 billion in 2015-2016. However, when comparing Australia with other OECD countries, public spending on early childhood and care programs is low and private spending is high. In the OECD country context, what Australia gets for its spending is a small amount of program per child compared with other OECD systems, EC systems. Children receive a guarantee of about 15 hours of kindergarten or preschool per week in the year just before they start and enter the school system. Our comparator and competitor countries deliver at least two and often three years of kinder before children enter school. So this is, not, this is a spot where current investment and policy doesn't, does nothing to address inequity and gaps in early capability and achievement. The Year for Kids Longitudinal Study, which we've, we've, uh, we are wrapping up at this point, shows children living in a range of risk factors are going backwards across the years, those children with high risk are going backwards across the years before they arrive at school. They're in progress. There are plenty of model programs, however, 
that have large effects on child development, closing gaps for children in low SES families so they enter school on par with their advantaged peers. So um, effectively, these programs demand well-trained staff with a focus on demonstrating an impact on children's learning and development. That's the focus. The second broad point, which brings early childhood in the, in the frame, I think, is in Australia we have two public, major public policy goals for public spending in EC. And because of this, the debate polarises. One goal is to help parents' workplace engagement. The other is child development for long-term human capital investment for society. This second goal barely gets airplay because of a decade of price patterns in, early in the early childhood market and high private burden. Families are disproportionately responsible for investing in the human capital development <coughs> formation idea, the benefit that's mostly returned to society. Unlike schooling, early childhood is a market and public spending is not matched with control over price. Childcare fees have risen far faster than the CPI in the past decade, each year, and the system has no inbuilt incentive to focus on access for the children who will benefit most. The child development goal is both um, directly and indirectly attacked under the guise of price. No need for well-trained staff. Get rid of the ratios designed to advance children's learning Anyone can look after children. These claims follow a child storage approach where parent, while parents work, just keep the kids fed and safe. For a key constituency, far more than a year's growth for a year's early childhood participation demands educators who deliver the child development gains children critically need before they get to school. That's different from the idea of anyone can look after children. Australia's education system outcomes are good, but they've, as been, is well known, they've been slipping over a decade. <laughs> and I would argue that early childhood is one place that could make a big difference if child learning and development goals actually led the policy and the funding decisions. This is evidenced by a large gap between the known potential of the early childhood programs that have large impacts and what we currently observe in our typical everyday programs as, as we've got evidence from the Ever Kids study. Looking at our competitor OECD countries <coughs> and the rapid change in early childhood provision in Asia, it's time to target early childhood spending much better and address young children's learning, social equity, and our social purpose. Yeah. <coughs> and I will just ask a, a quick follow-up because um, you know one of the headline issues from both major parties is an extra three billion yes. on what is yeah. still being called child care, mm -hmm. not children's development. Mm -hmm. So, is where, where do you put this? Is this investment? Is it waste? Is it something in the middle? Is it just more child minding? Or it's it? more child minding in the in the strict narrow sense, and I'm very sensitive in saying that to the fact that we have these two goals, and we we have low public investment. We need to put more investment in, but to get the education focus, the early childhood development focus that's promised in the rhetoric, we have to have far more um, targeted systems. Um, than this general, let's have, you know, we'll, we'll increase the childcare benefit. That's never, just look at the te decade past, it tells you not to go back. That could well push up prices. Call it, thank you. Mm. Glenn Savage. Thanks. Look, in, in my view, school funding is exemplary of David Easton's well known framing of policy as an authoritative allocation of values. So, put simply, funding decides who gets what. And in doing so, it reflects both the values of government, but it also reflects what we consider to be in the public interest. So in recent years, we've seen school funding being highly contested across OECD nations. Now in Australia, these debates have been driven by a whole complex range of factors, including um, fiscal challenges in the aftermath of the GFC. We've had a consistent shift towards private schooling enrolments. And there's also growing concerns in our federation 
there's two high levels of inefficiency and inequality. So the 2011 Gonski Review was designed to clean up funding arrangements in our nation and to create a more equitable needs-based funding system. Unfortunately, since its release, the ideals of the Gonski Reform have been subject to what I would call gross mutation and debates have descended into a hazy quagmire. This owes much, I think, to misleading political debates, which have given rise to a number of polarised positions. So we've got some people on one side saying, look, Gonski's the magic bullet, it's the messiah, it's going to fix all the problems in Australian schools, right through to people on the other end who tell us that funding doesn't matter at all. Now, debates have also been hijacked by what I think is a myopic focus on how much schools are getting. So by focusing on amounts of cash, debates have obscured the equally important question of what schools do with the money. So it's my hope that in today's session we can forge a more nuanced and generative terrain of debate by focusing on what we've been calling targeted investment in schools. So for example, there's a formidable body of international research evidence that tells us that funding is not a magic bullet, but it also tells us that funding clearly matters. So if we accept this body of evidence, then the question that we have to start asking is what matters most? So it's this question that we need to answer before we can even hope to create a system that's marked by greater transparency, greater accountability about how money is spent, but also about the impact that that money has in schools. Thank you. I'm going to ask Catherine Henderson to give us her presentation. Can I stand where you are? Yeah. So the reason that I'm standing is because I can either stand kneel or lie down. It doesn't seem appropriate to kneel. Um, and I have the time of back injury, which will be resolved shortly. Um, before I get going, in case I don't pick it up in my talk, I want to deeply reinforce what Colleague was talking about. A lot of agreement with many things, but my work outside of the University of Melbourne, or no, as part of the University of Melbourne, is with the uh, normal people in North East Arm and about their education. Um, I've worked in the Western Suburbs in health and education. If we don't get to early childhood and get it right, we're back for the rest of the time, so I do want to make that point. I am the director of the University of Melbourne Network of Schools, and so I'm in the practice side. I'm out there working with schools to implement. And um, so I'm going to talk about investment for impact. And if I'm not going to talk about waste, I'm certainly going to raise the question of priorities in expenditure. Um, I work with four, now four networks of schools, with 73 schools divided into four separate groups. Our networks include all sectors, all types of schools, K-12, primary, secondary, special education, special ed in and mainstream school. Uh, high, very high, and very low, and all the way in between um, socioeconomic status for the students of the schools. And we have the most amazing schools, including, of course, Canberra. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Who um, is one of the finest, most courageous people I've worked with. Now, um, we work with an overarching uh, focus in three areas. Primarily, we want everybody, the students included, to know. We want the students to know how they're learning and how they're going. We want the teachers and the school leaders and our network to know our impact. So knowing our impact drives us, informed by the MGSE clinical model. We work very strongly to build our leaders as instructional leaders. And finally, our premise is that through collaboration, we can achieve more than if we work on our own. Again, I'd say that applies to students more and more because of the changing economics of our world, uh, but to teachers in, in absolutely, um, school leaders, and that's how we work together in the network. And we work with a deep commitment and a deep conviction that every child can learn. It's built into all the work that we do. So um, we are about capability building. Um, and, and improving our professional practice to impact on students' learning. This is where we're talking about, we're, we're uh, making the gains, and we are making the gains, and this is where I believe deeply the investment is really important. And John Hattie talks about distractors, distractors, and he can spend your money on this and that. 
We have to spend our money supporting through the life of their learn of their work teachers in their professional practice. And then we're not the only um, profession that thinks that's worth doing. So our schools, as I said, range from the richest to the poorest in um, its SES status. One of our schools has an ICSIA SES status as measured by um, ACARA, and Barry McGaw told me that this particular school is ICSIA because I went and asked him. It normally be what we'd see in a remote indigenous school, but it's a um, regional school in Victoria. Our schools um, very soon, and I, I, I have to say, make a point because I've been a strong de defender um, and supporter of public education all my working life, um, but I've had the most fantastic experience working cross sectorally, and I think so of our schools. So, in any comments I'm making, I'm strongly supporting the cross sectoral work. Our schools have been able, in some ways, to work together and be more open and therefore more trusting and therefore more challenging of each other than they might be, certainly if they were a geographic one sector group of schools. So, um, <coughs> sorry. So our schools very soon, within the first two or three sessions together, are very quick to say, to acknowledge we're more in common than we have in difference. Um, so I'll give you examples. Outside of our formal seminars and training days, we've increasingly, increasingly got schools visiting each other within their network group, and now even across network groups. We had a school from Queensland who joined the network after visiting one of our schools because they thought the work was we doing. And so it, examples include Melton West, low SES, very dysfunctional community. Um, Kerry Grammer visited Melton because they were very interested in Melton West professional learning team structure. Now, the West went to Kerry because they're all together in their focus group working on lifting the performance of high performing students and Kerry Grammer has a specialist teacher in that space. We've had Footscray City College travelling to Robin Park. Um, so, <laughs> what, but that being said, I am really moved by all my difficulty is this. In visiting these schools, one of our schools has a new, brand new, $40 million building for drama and media and other things. That's fantastic. Um, and I don't begrudge them. If we could offer the same quality and level of um, facility and learning spaces to all our kids, I'd be really pleased. Others scrabble pitifully, I'm sure people in this room know about this, for enough money to paint a classroom or to put in a skylight in a dim, grim um, corridor. Um, they're proud when they put down a new carpet. And I walk through these schools and think, I'm not sure I'd want my child to be in this school because of the facility. They cannot um, afford, um, say, to re-stump so that the asbestos ridden building there is, um, so that the windows will open. So I welcome the state government's attention to capital infrastructure. Um, but I've seen really good teaching. I've literally seen really good teaching in a corrugated iron three-walled shed with a uh, dirt floor in the Northern Territory. So, um, so, <coughs> um, so why am I fussing about what these schools might need? Well, um, it costs more in these schools to develop and implement an intervention to support some of their students. So these schools, these poor schools, have more children who are immensely difficult to manage. They're out of control in the classroom. By the way, if they'd had really good early childhood programs, that's a better place. They're out of control in the classroom. They come from very distressed families with enormous pressures. And what our teachers are saying is we need uh, resources to support these kids because we're trying to focus on improving practice and our teachers are constantly distracted by someone who's going to wreck the classroom. And we, the Melbourne University people that I work with, we want to say, well, just focus on the learning. Don't worry about that. And we know from those who read and I work out. But it does cost more to intervene and support those children. That's one example of the kind of the question I've got about, if not um, waste, I'm asking about targeting. And that brings me straight back to where Glenn talked about. Targeting student need, Gomsky. So um, I could probably go on, but I think that's enough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, terrific. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you to all of our panel.
Um, before I go to some of the online questions, um, I think what Catherine has talked about, in particular her work with the network, is a very nice segue to Michael Musker, who's sitting in the front row. Michael, of course, is the principal of Cambria, and I know you've all been watching Revolution School. Yes, yeah, final episode tomorrow night. <coughs> Michael, I want to ask you, because you were starting your change program at Cambria, uh, before, I think, the Gonski review, but at a time when the, the then Labour government in Canberra was uh, pushing a lot of money into the states via national partnership money. Now, I guess two questions for you. What were, what were the guidelines you followed in determining how you would target your investment and get bang for the buck? And importantly, what were the decision, decisions you made as to what you would not spend money on? We've got a microphone. Okay. Yeah, we've got okay. Just well, if I want to stand up, I'd like to stand up. Okay. Come on, you've been on television before. <laughs> 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 Come on. This is this is uh, this is a little bit different. Yeah. Um, look, the thing is, our improvement journey has been a long time in progress. <coughs> when I began in two thousand and eight as principal at Canberra College, it is a completely different context to where, to what it is now. Um, the school was pretty much a shambles and it needed to be pulled together as an organisation before we could start to deliver the outcomes that needed to be delivered, that, that we owed our students. So we had to do some, and I think, you know, the other thinkers have put together some really good work on improvement. We followed the Zabar Marshall Kimber model where we, we got the preconditions for improvement right. And that's what we worked on really hard for the first few years. And that's where we, we, um, we spent the money, basically. Um, getting the leadership right, getting the orderly learning environment right that, uh, that Catherine alluded to. Um, and then we could get, we were in a state of readiness to deliver really strong improvements in teaching and learning in a consistent manner. We didn't want pockets of good practice. If we couldn't deliver this consistently across the school, we weren't interested and we considered ourselves unready. <clears throat> so, in the initial phase, we spent our national partnerships funding on leadership coaching to build leadership capacity, not only among the principal team, including myself. I mean, you know, you look at the elite sports people, they have individual coaches and they pay big money for it. Well, I think principals and principal teams and leading teachers also carry a huge responsibility and leadership coaching is a darn good idea to build that sort of that capacity to pull the organisation together and to, to become instructional leaders. Now I've lost my thread. Um, if, and, and now with the, the, the Gonski funding that we do receive and the equity funding that we do receive, it is definitely targeted in the manner that Field mentioned on building instructional capacity among our teachers and getting them to work in instruction in um, collaborative teams. So in the early days, yes, it was getting the preconditions right. We've got the preconditions right. We're a strong organisation. We're an effective school, and we have a whole school focus on improving teacher capacity. Waste. Waste. And what not to spend money on? <coughs> Look, um, one of the most important pieces of work that principals have to do is, is uh, stay focused, not be dragged off in, in silly directions. We've got to watch our, our department for doing that to us sometimes, making us go on wild goose chases and wasting a lot of time and energy. But what did we not do it? Well, we, we, just, we, we basically went back to the basics. We were a school on our knees and we, we went back to the absolute basics, literacy and numeracy, and anything that was a distraction from that, we just pushed it aside. Mm. We pushed the department aside, we pushed all the fads aside, and we've, st we've, we've remained focused uh, to the same plan for improvement that we started off with in 2008. Yeah. In fact, I think Mike Warren, you were saying to me that the one stage Canberra was doing too many things, but you ended up doing oh, a few yes. things really well. And that was the trouble with what we refer to as old Canberra which we were a very fatty sort of a school. We, we, we were this, we were that, we were this, we were that, and we were every smart idea that came along. And we were good at nothing, uh, to the point where our teachers were up, our, our students were underperforming, our good teachers were leaving us, our parents were disillusioned with us, 
and we were, you know, heading in a very bad direction. And it took a, a, a massive effort uh, on our staff, uh, on the behalf, behalf of our staff, to turn that around. You know, we're talking about an organisation of, you know, 12 to 1400 students, uh, you know, over 150 staff, and it takes all of those staff members to, to varying degrees to, to pull it all together. Yeah. Michael, thanks very much. And by, and by the way, all, all power to you for, um, you know, the... I must, I'm must. i sure I have the here, I must have been my... We need to quiet on the side that these cameras come in and put a bed in this room and that room and all those about buddies. And I know there were many challenges along the way, but well done. But we've got a question now. I'm, I'm very interested to go back to um, this issue around what Barry raised, what Jeff has raised around effective teaching and the way that perhaps teaching and the work of teaching, and we should say the work of students, perhaps can be reorganised. Um, and actually there's a question that from Julie that's come through that might get us into that, and perhaps Barry, you want to take this, because this again is an issue that's come up through the Canberra series. Why not increase class size rather than expand paraprofessionals? Yeah. <coughs> Well, you could do both. The, um, the research on class size shows, as I think is now well known, um, that reducing class size in the range in which we've reduced it doesn't make a difference. Uh, the early big meta-analysis on this was done by Gene Glass at the University of Colorado, and he showed that you get huge gains if you get down under 10 students with the teacher, or even down to one-on-one -on -one tutoring. Now, it makes on the possibility of having all teaching done like that, but that raises the possibility that students could sometimes be in bigger groups than they presently are at essentially no loss, and be in much smaller groups than they presently are with considerable gain and overall the net gain. So that's a, a restructuring of the way we manage instruction in a way that's impeded in many cases by the, the physical arrangements in schools with class rooms as opposed to other spaces, particularly in older schools. So you could, I wouldn't just willy-nilly increase class size, but I would look at, at more effective distributions of the resources we presently have to sometimes work in big groups and sometimes work in small groups. I mean, the fact of the matter is at the moment, without even going to anything as radical as I was suggesting about uh, changing the distribution between <coughs> teachers and paraprofessionals is, we are already oversupplying the teaching market. There are many more primary teachers graduated out of the universities then can find jobs. The New South Wales Education Minister tried to get the universities to reduce their numbers because they couldn't guarantee any kind of employment to them. The universities refused, said, no, we're independent, we can do what we want. And then he said, well, we won't give practical placements in government schools beyond a certain number of teachers. And that was the way he was trying to influence the university's choices. And then the federal government uncapped undergraduate places in universities and um, universities, in many cases, expanded teacher education on the grounds that they could readily get their students who wanted to do it, it was cheap to provide, and they would make lots of money out of the fundings coming in from the, the Commonwealth Government. So they treated primary teacher education as a cash cow and worsened the position. So we, that's the first thing we need to fix. Barry, can I just come in there, because you mentioned Finland. She's only got a couple of places where you can study teaching and highly selective, as you said. Mm. If we need fewer teachers, <clears throat> do we need fewer education faculties? <laughs> <laughs> um, probably. I mean, the, the <coughs> I actually don't know how many universities in Finland don't offer teacher education, but I know that uh, the ones I've talked in the last 12 months to. Uh, people at other conferences I've been at, from at least uh, three of the major universities, all of which have selection ratios, like the one uh, that Pasi Salberg talked here about in, in Stockholm, the vascular has a similar uh, selection ratio, uh, many more applicants than places. And uh, Pasi Salberg didn't say it in the lecture that he gave here, in the Dean's lecture, he said it at the dinner that Field convened afterwards. But they now selecting at such a stringent ratio at Vascular, that they were considering add, adding an additional criterion for selection into primary teacher education. That is, you could only be selected if you could sing in tune. 
on the grounds that in elementary schools, the teaching of music is very important. We need teachers who can sing in tune. And if we put that criterion in, we'll still get plenty of teachers with high skill. Okay. Jeff, could I ask you to, to just, uh, just take up this, this thing? And, and, sure. and if you want to relate it to what you talked about too, this important idea that we need effective teachers who are going into our schools and implementing proven strategies. Can we say that all our education faculties are producing graduates with those proven strategies? Well, I think we can say pretty confidently that that's not the case. Um, coming back to the question um, that, that was asked, um, I certainly wouldn't be arguing for increasing class size if it reduced the amount of time that teachers could spend working with individuals, understanding their needs, addressing their needs. Um, I mean, many classrooms, that, not that I go into a classroom a lot, but in many classrooms that I now go into, there are, it's very common for there to be two or three, sometimes more, adults in the room. Um, some of them are teachers, some of them are not, um, some of them are grandparents um, in the room assisting in various ways. Um, but I, I think we do face um, a, a big challenge, um, and, and Barry's put his finger on it, we chase a, uh, face a big challenge as a country um, to raise the status of teaching as a profession. Um, and I think we need to look at countries that have done this over a long period of time. Um, Finland is one, but there are other countries, um, Singapore and so on, that have succeeded in doing this. Um, and you know, the McKinsey report of a number of years ago now made the observation that countries can either get into a, an upward spiral, where as you make teaching more selective, you raise the status, which makes it even more selective, or countries can get into a downward spiral, where you have exactly the opposite happening. And I think right now we are in a downward spiral. Okay, but do we need to be more selective? Higher ATARs? What, what's your approach? Um, I think we need to set higher standards. We need to have more control over um, who starts initial teacher education, and we probably need um, clearer standards for registration um, as a teacher as well, um, so that we have um, a couple of points in the system um, where we are um, dealing with people who are not meeting standards. I think there are, um, and, and this is not just an opinion. Um, in, in conversations that I have with principals, a uh, common comment is, if we want to do something about raising literacy and numeracy standards in this country, we need to do something about the literacy and numeracy, numeracy standards of many teachers in our schools. Um, and uh, that's, that's why, in part, um, the Commonwealth um, has introduced the new literacy and numeracy assessments um, for people in um, initial teacher education programs to ensure um, that those graduates are at least meeting minimum standards of literacy and numeracy. Uh, field. I'm sure you want to come in there. So it, it comes back to the quality of graduates coming out of programs and, and being the Dean on the Teacher Education Ministerial Advisory Group with Minister Pine during 2014, we came at it by looking at the quality of the graduates coming out rather than the input requirements of how many hours did they get in every, every uh, <coughs> subject. And essentially, if you read the report carefully, it says how do you, it, the onus is on universities to demonstrate to the evaluators processes and the evidence that they used to know that their graduates had positive impacts on student learning. And then it's a matter then of getting the appropriate accreditation of those programs. So we're in an interesting phase at the moment where AITSL has gone about setting all of the standards and the processes for course accreditation. But, de but, but through, through the structures in Australia, that's been delegated to local bodies like the VIT and others. And I worry <coughs> that there won't be the um, steel to be able to say your graduates are not good enough and therefore they will not be registered as a teacher. Mm. And that was the general strategy of the Teacher Education Ministerial Advisory Group. And I think when that happens, uh, I think then we've got a chance of the, the knock-on effect will be we will have fewer teacher education programs. But the one recommendation that was, was rejected in the TMAG report was recommendation four. And that was, quote, there should be a national accreditation body. And the fact that there isn't a national accreditation <coughs> body, I think, presents major problems. You couldn't get that one through the... It was rejected from the, minister, the minister's office. Right, right, right. Okay. Just before, I've got some terrific questions here on early childhood and other things, but does anyone want to sort of burst in to say something on this question of... Uh, uh, teacher training and in the way we, we, we structure the work of teaching. Yes, good about that. Sorry, Peter, thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Nancy. 
agree that on the comments on initial teacher education, but running the numbers even quickly shows that if we improve the quality of all new people going into initial teacher education, as of today, then in 10 years that would make up 10% of the workforce. It's too slow. What do we need to do in parallel to improve the quality of the existing 90% of teachers that would still be there at the end of a decade? And particularly in regard to waste, can we really afford to let every one of those teachers and schools um, reinvent the best approaches from scratch, which is what we often seem to want to do? I'm going to ask Dean Ashenden just to make a comment here. Dean, um, if you would, because I know you've written about this issue of the different role of the teacher and particularly the way the work could be restructured, because I thought Barry took us interestingly into that territory by talking potentially about you could have larger groups, if you like, in the lecture style and more intensive <coughs> tutorial <coughs> training. I know you've written something about this, just for a comment or? I'm allowed to ask a question. You can ask a question, else. fine. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 I'm just going to let the, um, let the moment pass. On, on the restructuring question, I, I gave a lecture suggesting um, a higher ratio of paraprofessionals. Uh, about a kilometre down the road, 27 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and that leads to my question. Um, and I think it probably applies particularly to what Jeff um, and Barry had to say, but also I think slightly less directly to the other inputs. I think it's true that a lot is not now known about what is and isn't good practice in the conventional classroom setting. And uh, as we've heard from Karen Breyer about what can and can't be changed and how at the level of the school. The question then becomes, what's the transmission mechanism? How do those practices spread? Several speakers, including Barry and Jeff, have said that we've got to, have a must, but the question then arises of who and how. Um, my question, particularly to Jeff and to Barry, but also to others is, in a country which has its school system divided into three sectors, all funded at different levels and in different ways, where state governments are very close to the management and control of education and schools and have um, uh, spent two out of three years in election mode, uh, when you have a highly adversarial industrial system working on a very rigid uh, way of organising the work of teachers and students, which is sometimes referred to as the grammar of schooling. Given all those realities about the structure and control of the system, what would be their bets placed on the kind of practice at the classroom and school level uh, being uh, the rule rather than the exception within, let's say, 20 years? Uh, Jeff, Barry, who wants to take that? Do we want to answer Pete's question? Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, why don't, why don't okay, we... Okay, what did you want to do? Answer well, the, the, I'm happy to have a go, um, because I think um, my response to both Pete and Dean would be somewhat similar. Um, I think we do know a lot um, as a profession about highly effective practice, highly effective teaching. Not, not to say there's a single bullet, you know, that um, there's a single best way to teach. That's not true, but we do know a lot about highly effective teaching practice. We know a lot about um, what highly effective school leadership looks like. We know a lot about what whole school improvement looks like. I think, as I said um, in my opening comments, one of the things we need to do um, is to capture what we do know to make sure that we're clear about what is known, find ways to promulgate that, and um, to pick up my point, to find ways of identifying the people in our schools and our, and our schools um, that are illustrative of best practice, thinking about how we can get schools that are implementing, and teachers and leaders who are implementing best practice, um, supporting others um, in their learning how to do that. So it's a, it's a learning process. Um, there are structures, as you say, that make all of that difficult um, in our schools, um, but I think that's a challenge. It's a professional challenge that we face 
um, to clarify our knowledge um, and, and to find ways of promulgating it, um, um, particularly find ways of sharing it across the profession um, so that we're lifting performance um, of lower performing schools, lower performing school leaders, lower performing teachers. Yeah. Well, we don't have to do it for them. They can do it for themselves um, as well. Um, the My School site offers comparative information of a type schools have never had before. The primary school that I went to in Brisbane um, is much more yuppie than it was when I went there. Um, it's got an index of socio-educational advantage, almost two standard deviations above the national mean. Very advantaged school. They didn't need the my school site to tell them that. It may have told them more precisely than they knew, but they all knew that these were pretty rich kids from professional homes, um, parents all graduates. Um, they also didn't need the my school site to tell them that their performance was well above the national average. The national average was published. They knew their own result. What they didn't know till the my school site came out was that compared with other schools with similar students, they were at the bottom of the pile. They were coasting very assured about how well they were doing until they suddenly discovered in their circumstances they were not doing it. And I talked to the principal of that school. They transformed that school, having been shocked by the, by the first set of results. And they were also given the names of schools um, with which the comparison was being made. Uh, they could find where those schools were. And deliberately, though some complained about this, they were not schools only in their own sector or even in their own state. And she was talking at one point about coming down here and going to Surrey Hills Primary School, which was in that first set of data, a school with similar kids doing very much better. So it liberates schools to do what they want, um, to pursue improvement and to see from whom they might learn lessons. So um, systems can do the sort of stuff that Jeff's talking about as well, and teachers and schools can do it by themselves. And if you want evidence that schools have got much more freedom than they often imagine they have, I'll give you two pieces of example, two examples. Way back when I worked in the Queensland Education Department as a teacher, very, very centralised system. The principal of the secondary school in Rockhampton was reported in the press as having done something quite innovative with kids off the campus in the weekend press. And the regional director phoned him and said on the Monday, um, I was interested to see what was said about the school. Do you have departmental approval to yeah. <laughs> He said, yes, I do. I've got it in writing. Would you like me to read you the letter? Yeah. And he read in the letter, Dear Mr. Smith, I'm happy to advise you of your appointment as principal of the school. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Phil McKenzie's doctoral thesis showed, among other things, that even in an environment in Victoria where schools were formula based in their funding, school principals and school ma management distributed the resources they had very differently within the schools. Some cross subsidised from large, <coughs> lower secondary to small upper secondary classes, some cross-subsidised in other ways. There was much more flexibility, even in highly centralised systems, than we sometimes imagine. It's a good point about principals using the authority they have. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah I'm coming to you. <laughs> you want to be coming on? Just to hear can come back to yeah, one of the two very specific, specific questions. Okay, okay. thank you. Um, but just thinking about states and unions, in the early childhood profession, there's been a quiet revolution happening as well. It's not really in the press because it's all about the price and the cost and so on, shocking. But um, th this, is a, this is an area where professionalising the whole workplace is fairly new as an idea. And um, the idea of working together in teams and working with coaching and mentoring processes has really taken hold across a whole range of early childhood um, care and education provision services. <clears throat> the thing I think that has yet to happen in that space, it, and you know, looking at the, the, there's a lot of impetus, there's a lot of um, keenness to raise the status of early childhood educator. For the first time in 2010, the legislation in Australia right across the country required that there be an early childhood leader, an educational leader in every single setting whether it was a family daycare or a long daycare home or a preschool. And it's a little like the reverse of what Barry was saying earlier. You know, there's so few teachers in that system and so many paraprofessionals, and it's sort of trying to start the other way. But what hasn't kind of taken hold yet is this really strong focus on children's learning and development, because the focus is very much on the quality of service 
And that's been long entrenched through a long history from 1993 of the national accreditation system and now the national quality standard and so on. And it picks up some very important basics and threshold points. But if you don't drive educational program and practice, you're not going to make the difference that is promised in the rhetoric and was in fact part of the reason that governments increased their budgets for this. So Colin, I've got two questions um, uh, for your area. One from, um, one from Dan, which is, should preschool be full-time? And that is two years uh, preschool full-time for the school. And then another from Judy, from Judy Pro. Does the investment in early childhood education pay off long-term? Do children maintain the gain mm -hmm. or slip back? Okay. Well, in terms of whether preschool should be full-time, it's kind of a yes, but. Um, there is a, there's quite a lot of evidence to suggest that um, a program from two and a half, three to five or six when kids are entering school, typically, that's part-time, perhaps, that is well organised for children's learning, focusing in on learning and development, building social um, development, so building self-regulation, managing attention control, all of the things that go around focusing on learning and the cognitive, um, the, you know, learning <coughs> language uh, is really important. It doesn't have to be a full-time program as such. And yet, having said that, there are two goals in the early childhood space, and one is about workforce participation. It's a very 1950s idea that you will have a short-term sessional program in a setting if you've got a joint expectation that families are going to be able to manage the economic care of their children because that's an important part of care um, and so to say you're going to do 10 hours a week or something just leaves this real chaos in the, in the contemporary work family space whereas um, other countries have tended to provide, to provide longer amounts of program that are more consistent and children are stable from an earlier age in a, in a more regular setting. The amount of access children get here in Australia is so varied and it's across so many different services. It's not like some sort of piecemeal approach. So getting some concerted effort around a child's learning and development and building consistency is really difficult in Australia as opposed to other places. Thanks, the Chris. second point... And was about two years, two years of preschool? Oh, two years of preschool? Definitely. I'd like more of preschool, more of um, taking the early childhood, what's in the public media about childcare, because ECEC, Education Care, was put together in 2009 under the new National Quality Framework very deliberately, but that story has kind of been lost a bit. And it's still seen as there's childcare and there's kingdom. And that's not how it needs to be. And if, in fact, if you look in Queensland or um, New South Wales, but if you look at the growth of the provision of 15 hours of kindergarten for children as, as a guarantee, a lot of that provision, more than half of it in some states, is provided in long daycare settings. Okay, so we've effectively privatised, put into the market, early to preschool education. That's mm. something that's not <coughs> Glenn, can I bring you back into the conversation and, and let's bring this back because we've only got a few minutes more to, um, to the question of Gonski. And of course the mantra there was always uh, needs-based sector blind funding. That, that was the phrase. What is that, from your experience, what does that look like on the ground? Well, well, I mean, I think it's a myth in some ways. We, 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 we never implemented the Gonski ideal. You know, people talk about now we've got Gonski funding. Well, we, we don't have Gonski funding. We have something that resulted as, as a result of a complex political process that followed the report being released. I mean, the second that Julia Gillard said, no school will lose a dollar, yeah. that's when we didn't have needs-based funding. <laughs> So, you know, and in Victoria, we have, a, we have a different model. New South Wales, we have a different model. So, you know, we have essentially money coming out of the federal government going into pots of money that the states and territories use, reformulated in line with state and territory formulas that are then given to schools here. So we don't really have a pure Gonski system, and we definitely don't have a sector-blind system. But if, in terms of my experiences, I mean, I've worked as a teacher for about five or six years in a range of different 
disadvantaged schools in Australia and in the UK. And, you know, during that time, I've seen a whole lot of examples of needs-based funding being used in really effective ways that have had a significant positive impact for the schools, for teachers, for students and for the, for the school community. And, you know, there was one school I was working in, for example, which channeled needs-based funding into a whole range of different mechanisms and interventions for newly arrived refugee students. And this, this ranged from things like targeted literacy and numeracy programs, through to other things like student health programs, wellbeing programs, cultural integration programs, and so on. Now, I can tell you from first-hand experience that if that, that money had been pulled, it would have had an enormously negative impact upon those newly arrived refugee students and on the school as a whole. And I'll use this as an, as an opportunity to make a slightly related point to some of the others. But firstly, I think this, this experience that I'm, that I'm relaying tells us that not all, not all important things that come out of needs-based funding can be easily quantified in terms of NAPLAN schools or, or PISA schools. You know, the, the wellbeing programs in those schools, they may have had no obvious impact on NAPLAN school in that school, but they were still really important. So, I mean, I think there's, the net plan and PISA are important, don't get me wrong, but they're not the only way of judging whether needs-based funding is important or has had an impact. And related to that, which links to several of the comments that have been made, I think what this shows is that schools need to be given um, the flexibility um, to tailor and to innovate and to adapt things to their local context. So I think from watching Revolution School, you know, you can see the way that Michael has worked with the parents, with the local community, to get them on board, to get them on the same page, and to have a kind of a, you know, kind of a joined up approach to, to improving things. And this is really important because I worry that, I mean, I think it's absolutely essential to start to say, these are some of the things that make more of an impact than others, and these are some of the things schools should be doing, perhaps, rather than these others. But I wouldn't want us to see us go down a path where it became so compliance driven and so prescriptive that schools are essentially ticking boxes and saying, right, I've done this, where's my money? Because, you know, you're taking, you're taking the innovation away. You're taking it away from principals and teachers who know best what those young people need in those schools. And they need to be able to test things out. And they might fail and stuff might not work. But that's okay because you've got to try stuff out. And eventually when something does work, then you've got what Jeff's calling best practice and we can start sharing that with other schools and so on. So, so yeah, I mean, I sort of answered the question but went on several tangents. Yeah, that was that. <laughs> <laughs> and Catherine, I'm wondering about you pick up on that question of the needs-based funding, but also related actually to a question that's come in from Catherine Hall, who is from Melbourne University. Is the desire to give families a choice misguided if it leads to inefficiencies in the system? The answer to that second question is yes, if it leads to. And there are people in the room who are much more, um, who are probably more competent as researchers in describing the exact impact of choice. But there's two things that I want to talk about. One is to follow on, can you hear me? Uh, follow on from what Glenn said about schools and money. One of the problems schools have. Just coming to you, Catherine. Yeah, there we go. It's a school I work with uh, in the Northern Territory. The principal's been a principal for about probably 25 years. He's kind of gnarled old and very, very cynical and reserved about departing from government um, opportunities. And he said to me, I have learned, Catherine, I have learned not to rely on soft money. Schools need some certainty about the resources that they're going to spend. And that money is, in many cases, spent wisely, and in some cases, it's absolutely wasted. There's no question about that. Totally support Glenn on the notion of the compliance versus the develop, what I call a developmental model. But what I wanted to say to you is this is what we base our learning from in the University of Melbourne Network of Schools. And I'm very interested in efficiency, in getting, you know, getting the fastest, best result you can. It takes time in schools. Um, so we derive our learning, first of all, always from what students make, say, at, at right and I've got the fourth one missing. Mm -hmm do, but basically the evidence of what the children are learning, that makes obvious sense, although it's a new concept in a lot of schools. Secondly, we draw our learning from each, from our own and each other, the incredible wealth of experience and knowledge within the group. 
We don't actually talk about low performing and high performing and who's going to learn from whom. We talk about the wisdom in the group. And I can tell you I've got schools because the criteria for getting in aren't if you're good or bad, if you've done the several years work Michael had had, or if you're just starting on the journey. And the third thing I think this is powerful is we draw from the knowledge and the experience, the wisdom of the researchers. So we have that partnership. And if people want to test out an idea, we can test that idea against the evidence mm. quickly. And we have fantastic people who come and talk to our schools and uh, with deep wisdom and knowledge, but also inspirationally. So that, I think, is... I, I can't stand the words quality teacher, by the way. It's like, you know, you're going to pour something into them. I really don't like I'm very happy to talk about improving the quality of our practice. But we do that through those mechanisms. And there is an efficiency in that, which is not always evident if a school picks another school. But Surrey Hills is doing brilliantly. They may or may not be able to be explicit about what they've done in a way that, um, you know, I measure what we do against the high yield strategy of St John had the identified. So I did want to talk about that. But I am deeply concerned about the divisions, not in what schools are trying to achieve. They're fantastic, all our schools are wonderful to work with, but the divisions <coughs> that are created by this very um, strange funding mechanism we have in Australia. Catherine, thank you very much. And look, we are, uh, I've got many other questions, but we're close to time. We're going to let you go and, you know, have a drink and chat about all this. So I hope you'll agree that this has um, uh, been an important issue to discuss. I'll, I'll end with, uh, before I ask you to thank the panel, um, I'll share my particular fantasy with you. And that is um, on this funding question, and that is in the same way that it took conservative like Richard Nixon to go and open up China and completely change the geostrategic you know, landscape um, in relation to uh, China-US policy and, and uh, by extension um, foreign policy for Australia. It will take um, perhaps a National Party MP from one of the poorest parts of Australia to the elected Prime Minister of Australia. Perhaps his name is Adrian Pickley, I don't know. Uh, and, and eventually the sheer logic of looking again once and for all at a very different distribution model. That is my fantasy. I will leave you to you know, discuss, say what idiot she is, but there it is. Could you please thank our panel, Bill Rickards, Jeff Masters, Jeremy Ward,